Hey there guys, this is Rainbow Plasma. I hope you enjoy our interview with Cosmic Unicorn coming up in just a moment. But before we start, I'd like to point out, um, Pinky Dash's audio has been having some issues the last, um, well, it's been a, a, an issue for a long time, but uh, over the last four or five weeks or so, there's been a real big issue with it. And um, we've been looking into it, and I think I found the problem this week. Um, there's some electrical interference with his mic, meaning that when we noise removal to get rid of the background noise, it, it's, taking, it's cutting out a lot of his um, audio quality. So uh, we're looking into that, and uh, we don't have a solution right now, but hopefully by next week we will be able to have his audio up and uh, better. And if not next week, then guaranteed the week after that. Um, so there's that. Uh, so you, you won't be hearing from him a lot, and when you do from, hear from him, it'll be pretty bad audio. Uh, also, he was having some issues uh, with the internet connection. Um, I believe there's some sort of big storm going on uh, down where he was, so there was some issues with that so you won't uh, hear much of pinky dash this episode but hopefully um next week or the week after we can figure out a, a new microphone get that situation sorted out and then we'll have him in much crisper clearer audio because uh it's strange when we're on like a skype call we hear him perfectly fine but when it comes out in his audio form it, it sounds quite bad so hopefully we'll get it up to a level where you guys are hearing what we're actually hearing and um he'll be able to be a bigger part of the podcast because when he has such bad audio it's kind of hard to edit him into places anyways uh hopefully that'll happen in the next few weeks i hope you guys enjoy the interview it was a lot of fun to make and i hope you guys find some fun insightful things in it Hello and welcome to episode 31 of the QDR Crusaders for January 29th, 2013. Welcome back guys, I hope you enjoyed last week's episode, and um, my name is Rainbow Plasma, and today I'm joined by my co-hosts... Uh, Burnda1, and I'm the special guest coordinator. I'm FuddyGuy317, and I'm the art coordinator. I'm Pinky Dash, I do all the questions and whatnot, miscellaneous junk. So... Stuff. Pinky Dash is having some audio issues. I think his internet's not doing so great. So if he doesn't pop in this episode, then um, that's, that's the reason that's why. Much. But yeah. yeah. So last week we had an episode on clouds. But I did talk. So that's all good. <laughs> Media. <Just immediately. laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. we're, we're gonna have. Yeah, yeah. We're gonna have a couple. It, it, it's of, in my audacity. It's all good. We're gonna have a couple of interruptions here because apparently he can't hear us half the time. But that's okay. <laughs> um, oh, I heard you were going. I just wanted to interrupt. Gonna, it's gonna be um, a major editing job. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not. I just, I just, I just wanted to week. interrupt. It's okay, fun. so Flutter Guy was away last week, and you're back now, which is great. Um, yeah. We had we had our clouds episode Perfect. last week because Yay. we couldn't get our special guest on. Uh, it turns out it was just a it was just a misunderstanding in terms of times and dates and things like that. I derped on the date. That's my bad. But yeah, and I derped on the announcements. But sorry. <laughs> regardless of the wide variety of derpage found on and off this show. Um, we actually have our special guest this week, so everyone should give a warm welcome to Cosmic Unicorn. Hi. Hooray. Hooray, yeah. As you were yeah, yeah, yeah. yes. saying before the show, this will finally give people your gender. Don't tell anyone. <laughs> you had a funny story about Everfree Northwest, didn't you? Oh, yeah. Um, I had my boyfriend there helping me at my table because oh, how could I man a table by myself? It's ridiculous. And people kept coming up and asking him if he was Cosmic Unicorn or telling him that they liked his art. <laughs> <laughs> and he would just have to keep pointing to me. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I remember um, when I first stopped by, I went, I remember uh, Everfree Northwest, I had the pleasure of meeting you actually, uh, for those who don't know that. And I happened to stop by your table, but you were out at the time yeah. and your boyfriend was just sitting there. <laughs> And I was like, I thought I saw somewhere that Cosmic Unicorn was a female. He's like, oh, yeah, she's away. I was like, oh, well, this is awkward. I'll be back in like half an hour or so. But I was totally confused. You were, you were one of those people? Well, I had heard in a comment or somewhere something that, but I wasn't positive because I'm not that big of an online stalker. But, um, it's okay. I kind of make it ambiguous. <laughs> That's a, no, it's fine. That's all right. My gender gets confused all the time, and like I was saying, yeah. I have a podcast well, with thirty episodes. Well, Flutter Guy and Rainbow Plasma are secretly female. So. 
You, you're you're a girl, right? You're a classmate? Yeah. Oh, yeah, of course. <laughs> as long as as long as we're on the same page here. Yeah. Okay. I'll I'll be whatever right, gender jo- you are. <laughs> Joking about genders aside, um, uh, cosmic unicorn. For those who don't know and are fans, people watching, uh, and for those who maybe haven't heard of you or heard about your art, a generic question we like to ask on the show is if you could explain maybe who you are or what you do as an artist, or just tell us a little bit about yourself. It's kind of an open question, but uh, hopefully it... Alright then. Um, Well, (laughs) I'm an art student, and that's about it right now. Um, And being an art student is kind of a full-time job. Uh, Lots of homework, (laughs) lots of work, although I am working kind of part-time on an indie game project about squirrels, so that's fun. <laughs> but student is basically my life right now, so. <laughs> but there's always time for ponies, Craig. Um, I don't know. <laughs> These days, not so much. <laughs> I'm <Aww>. trying. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's tough, especially with school. Uh, I'm, I know, especially right now, I had a couple of things that I, I wanted to try out in terms of artistic stuff, and I've just found that it's it's... You know, the workload kind of picks up around this time of year, and uh, especially, like you said, with art students, it's always, you kind of have that big workload all the time, right? Yeah, pretty much. Mm-hmm. That's tough, that's tough. It's always fun when you can work ponies into something you do academically, though. I know you've done that a few times. Yeah, um, once or twice for a project, and then for homework. The, the Fluttershy, <laughs> the anatomy of a Fluttershy, and then um, the Seattle ponies were a project of mine. You did a... <laughs> Master study on Gustav Dor, didn't you? What, did you add the pony in before or after? On yeah, that? the study was just of the tree, and then I drew Celestia uh-huh. separately on a piece of paper, and I just added it in. Separately. You know, I thought it was funny because you did that as a master study, and then I ended up uh, doing a master study of your master study with a Celestia mm-hmm. in it because I fell in love with that piece, and so we like happened to feature that piece of yours, and then like my awful master study of yours redone in graphite. <laughs> <laughs> And that was a lot of fun. So, Burned, you you know, I think we should talk just first and foremost about kind of the connection between you and and Cosmic Unicorn because you've, a lot of the stuff that you've had on this show and a lot of the stuff that you've brought up on this show has roots with the guests that we have on today. So, do you want to draw the connections there? Um, Well, connections, ah. I guess it first started out as when I first, like, became a brony. I started looking at different artists and different things that I found interesting. And Cosmic Unicorn, I guess, they happened to be one of those artists that attracted my attention. Because at the time, I had just started taking Drawing One, and I had an interest in art. And, like, a blooming interest in art. And so, all throughout Drawing One, I was constantly just wanted to draw ponies and was looking at other artists for inspiration. So um, I would look at Cosmic Unicorn's pieces for different inspiration and things like that because all of the art that you happened to put on your deviant art was like something you were doing for an art project or some kind of recreation mm-hmm. of like an old art master or something. Yeah. So it was always really cool because you took a more educational sense and an educational mind behind the art that you created rather just than just making pretty pictures of ponies. Because I found that to be everywhere, but like the more educational sense or like fine art versions of ponies I found harder to find. Yeah, it was, it was kind of more of a matter of efficiency. Like I want to, you know, I spent all day at school like drawing still lives and drawing a shadow sphere or drawing the figure, you know, just sort of really academic, boring things a lot of the time. And so I'd come home and then to practice the same principles, I would just do ponies or draw ponies. (laughs) (laughs) And then it turned out people started liking them, so I just kept drawing them. And it's it's gotten out of hand now. (laughs) (laughs) Is it it more freeing to draw ponies as opposed to, like, schoolwork? Um, Like, can you have a bit more of a creative edge? Well, yeah. I mean, I always used it as, like, because I can practice all the same rules and art principles and everything. And... Even, they're simple. They're simple. They're basically shadow spheres with legs. I mean, they're incredibly simple sh- shapes. <laughs> and so it's it's fun to practice things like light with them, you know, or whatever. You did a light study of, like, a Celestia doll, didn't you? Oh, yeah, that was recently. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I would just use it as kind of, like, a fun way to practice all the rules, basically, after school. When you did the uh, Celestia 
Uh, that was a painting, right? That was a traditional yeah, painting. You were learning how to do oil painting, right? oil painting. Yes, I just started learning how to oil paint um, in the fall. Nice. Yeah, um, another random thing um, when we've crossed paths was uh, I was just learning to oil paint, and um, I had just completed my painting one final mm -hmm. uh, that was a master study, in quotes, of a Blitz Ponies piece um, where I kind of did my own little interpretation of it. And... Right when I finished it, you did a little, like, critique post on the r slash My Little Pony Vector School mm -hmm. uh, on Reddit. Mm -hmm. And, like, right when I finished, oh. and it was, like, perfect timing. And then I was like, oh, yeah, and I, like, took the opportunity <laughs> opportunity to post my art piece on that. And you actually did a really awesome critique, and it turns out you do a lot of awesome critiques. But um, <laughs> I guess that's another little thing with Cross Paths where you did a critique on my oil painting when you were learning oil painting and I was learning oil painting and it's really cool. And that was what actually made me finally grasp value. And that's how apparently all these memes have started. But <laughs> oh God, I started it. <laughs> we'll, we'll get into value in a second. My yeah, goodness. That's why I brought up value um, <laughs> at first on the show was because of that, because seeing the use of value in my own piece from your critique just made it click seeing it in my own work. Mm -hmm. That's usually how it works. So, Mm -hmm. uh, so that, anyway, so no, I had a question about that. Mm -hmm. um, do you often do critiques for uh, people on DeviantArt or people in different communities, like art, like artistically speaking? Um, I do them whenever I have time, which is not often. But whenever I see a piece of artwork that I really like, and regardless of the skill level, it really doesn't matter to me. Um, what I do to show the person that I like it is I'll give them a critique and how I think that they could make it better. And I'll show them by like editing it and everything because you can, you can talk about how you should change it and you can you know, type about it or whatever, but it's better to just show the person what yeah. I'm talking about. I definitely know what you and mean. Then I, and then I try to <laughs> explain things so that anyone else who reads it, you know, can get an idea. And it also helps summarize the information in my own head. So it's kind of an ex a personal exercise in and of itself. Mm -hmm. So I can kind of, I don't know, just... Yeah. Review, um, review my brain. From what I've heard from a couple of teachers, one of the best ways to actually learn, even in your own art, is through critique. Mm -hmm. um, and we tell that to a lot of people, especially uh, in vectors and like the Vector Club, because to see something that's so meant to be so perfect. But no, I really appreciate that critique, by the way. It was awesome. It actually really helped me. Oh, awesome. Yay. Yeah. How long do you usually spend on critiques? Because uh, just looking at specifically Burns one, because that's the one we brought up, um, not only not only did you did you shift a lot of because uh, you, you were talking with him not necessarily about color but but about the value of it, um, and you you shifted a piece and then you and you did like a step by step recreation uh, of the piece. Uh, you know how long does that take you? Um. Well, for Burns, I don't know. Maybe an hour or two. I'm not sure. I actually went downstairs and like mixed a little bit of paint as well. But I don't know. Maybe two hours. It really depends. <laughs> Sometimes. Huh. No. You've done a lot of really cool, uh, cool critiques for a lot of people. There was one that you did um, for... What was his name again? It, 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 it was Nel, Nel Nelvacre. Vakre? I think yeah. it's pronounced it's Nelvacre or something mm -hmm. like that. But um, it was about his landscape piece. Mm -hmm. And you went into depth, on, into depth on everything and the value and like the composition and space in it and atmospheric perspective and like it it was awesome, and again, it was super educational for me. And now I constantly see the things that you mentioned on that in other like pieces, even pieces fe featured on the show. No, oh, landscapes and, are my favorite. So yeah, um, so <laughs> I guess that leads into my question: is do well, do you do a lot of landscape pieces, and do you enjoy doing them? Um, yes, I do. Yes. I do <laughs> love landscapes. There. I don't know, there's something really peaceful about them. And my mom is a landscape painter, or was for a while. Uh, now she's painting crazy birds. But uh, landscape... You have a lot of really awesome landscape pieces in your galleries. Yeah. And uh, there could stand to be more, though. <laughs> well, there was one. You have a Canterlot Work in Progress 2.0. It's just like a black and white oh. version of a background. Oh, yes. I'm still waiting to see that color, because it's beautiful. Oh, black don't and white. worry. It will be colored. <laughs> You'll see at Everfree. Ooh. Oh my gosh. There Don't go. say that to me. My wallet, it will hurt. <laughs> Burn, your wallet is infinite from what I've heard. 
<laughs> from what I've experienced. <laughs> Speaking of infinitely poor burn, um, and spending way too much money at cons, uh, your artwork at your con was awesome. You had a piece with Applejack that you did in pen, uh-huh. and you were selling the original there, and I love that. It was awesome that you had that for sale there, and I, I even have it, like, right in front of me here on my desk. Yes. And it's got, like, your signature on it, and then you actually did, um, a, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? A commission uh-huh. of my OC. And then you ended up doing two of them, which was like, like yeah, you mind. know, I like I've never done commissions at a con before, so I was like really nervous about drawing with <laughs> lot. You know, it's really hard for me to draw with lots of people around. It's like, <laughs> my brain does not like it at all. Oh yeah. And yeah. so um, it didn't turn out how I wanted, so I wanted to do another one. And uh, I actually, for the convention, I really wanted to do ink drawings, but I didn't practice enough beforehand, and I was really nervous, so I didn't want to <laughs> risk it. So uh, hopefully this this yeah, time no, well, I'm, I'm super to happy with both of them. <laughs> <laughs> I I will definitely be taking up the up on that offer. Mm-hmm. Well, all right. <laughs> <laughs> now we love both of them. Um, we featured them on an episode like based around that con, and I got a um, commission from like e- uh, for each of our podcast members for Rainbow Plasma, Flutter Guy, and Piggy Dash. I got them each a commission from a different artist. Rainbow Plasma I had John Azeko, Flutter Guy. I had. Um, uh, Kim Art, I think was the name. Or no, that was Pinky Dash. And then the guy does, uh, no, I had Kenny W. Flutter Guys, I had uh, not Milkshake, but... It's the uh, person who does uh, mosquito, Dr. Horrible. Giant Mosquito. Yeah, yeah, yeah Giant Mosquito. Yeah. And so they each had a little commission of their OC, and then you happened to do mine, so we featured all that in a big episode, and it was a lot of fun. <laughs> By the way... Those have been shipped out as of this week. <laughs> yeah. So, Yay. when was Ever Free Northwest again? You're not again? to tell people. I already feel horrible now. <laughs> <laughs> it was, it's just, it's become like a reoccurring joke, and I can't believe it's actually happened now. Because I was just expecting I you to bring them to Ever Free Northwest. I finally <laughs> kicked myself to do it, because what ended up happening was, like, I got them all, and I got them the thing, and I just hand writ, hand wrote letters and put them in the packages, like, last week, and then I stuck them in my car. But then I never got the chance to go to, like, the post office, (laughs) like, after school and stuff. So, I, on MLK holiday, I ended up driving all the way to college just to find out it was closed. So, I was like, what am I supposed to do today? (laughs) And I was like, oh, I have these packages I can make. (laughs) How convenient. So, I took all day to, like, sharpie your addresses on them and ship them out. (laughs) You took all all day? (laughs) All day. (laughs) I made sure that writing better be, better be spectacular. Then <laughs> it, it was awful. You, you did on one. I even wrote Flutter Guy wrote your name Flutter Guy, and I was like, <laughs> like scribbled out and then put your real name. Nice, nice, <laughs> nice. It's just become like a, it's. It's not even like I don't. It's not a big deal. Like feel free to take as much time as you want because it's a gift to us. But I just it's like it's become like a funny thing now. Yeah. It's just like hey, if you ship those off again, no, no. It's like, like <laughs> well, six months later. Away. It's like oh right, yeah. <laughs> Pinky Dash is, unfortunately, is going to take, like, 20 to 30 days to get all the way to Australia. What? Are you yeah. shipping it instead of flying it? <laughs> <laughs> I, Literally shipping it. It was the one that didn't cost me 30 bucks to ship he, he, it. Was the yeah, cheap so one. It, it'll be on a boat. He, <laughs> yeah, he nice. stuck it in a, um, a kangaroo and sent the kangaroo swimming to you. <laughs> <laughs> that was a flying kangaroo, mind you. Oh, man. Uh, so back to Cosmic Unicorn. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> <Our> guest <laughs> for the show. Um, a, a piece that caught my eye, and, and, it's, and it's a piece that a ton of people have seen uh, was the uh, kind of adapted version of your comic. It's called The Sisters. Mm-hmm. And uh, you did this for Forever Free. And um, it, it's just, uh, I don't know, there's there's so much to these pieces that just astound me because uh, as someone who I don't consider myself, at least at the moment, artistically inclined. I mean, everyone can learn and everyone can practice and everyone can get to a certain point. But, um, you know, at the moment... <laughs> That's funny, um, <laughs> but you know, you know, for a piece like this with such a, a, an amount of detail, you know, how long does it take you to make something like the sisters? Um. Well, not only how long, but like what goes into developing something like this? Yeah. Like, what do you even think about like composition, color? I'm actually very interested in the composition. <laughs> Since it was a remake, I mean, I already kind of had the idea of how I wanted to do it. So I, I basically just thumbnailed it out, and that's where you draw little tiny versions of the image. Mm-hmm. You know, just really quick sketch, and you know, thumbnails are essential to any large, elaborate piece. It takes so much of the work out of it, because you can draw a bunch of little tiny versions of it. 
and play around with the composition, like where you want things to be, and then you just slowly draw them bigger and bigger, sketch them larger and larger, and then you draw your, your working sketch, and then you jump into painting it. So, you know, that was a step, um, but I don't know how long it took me, per, uh, hours-wise. Um, I would say maybe 10 or 15 hours. I really have no idea. <laughs> I just realized the landscape in the background behind Celestia is the black one of the black and white landscapes that I just mentioned. Yes, I also recycle pieces because it saves time. <laughs> <laughs> so that's my that's my dirty secret right there. So I cut corners. I noticed I found it out. <laughs> <laughs> and yet and yet it's still much better <laughs> than anything we can do. Uh, when when you recycle a piece do you um, tend to draw over it or do you just use the the original material and kind of size it? Um, I usually try and change it enough so that it doesn't look like the original <laughs> that it was. Um, yeah. It just depends. I usually change it to match the scene. So It was a landscape piece, so it was perfect for yeah. an actual piece of art. I mean, that's what it's meant for. We're, mm -hmm. we're vector artists. We know there's no thing as recycling. It's all resources. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, yeah, and vectoring especially. Yeah. Well, yeah, um, and that's, a, that's actually a technique I learned from Future Poly, which is a digital art school here in uh, Washington that just opened up about two or three years ago and uh, that was one of the things that the guys there talked about was reusing your own work in other work because it saves time and you know you can get unique looks and etc and uh, so I was borrowing a technique from them. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Um, oh this piece was a piece from a larger part you did it was from your comic and the name of that was discordantly correct you know, yes um what went into making that discordant discordantly comic um, we can't really show everything on the screen right now for those watching but if you go to her deviantart you can check out the whole thing and it's an awesome comic having to do with um celestia and luna and then um the interaction between like discord and that whole area yes i still need to finish the remake i've been hung up and haven't had a <laughs> chance to do that ah, so much stuff to do um yeah that was interesting um <laughs> that was i did that or was it last year because that's when the episode came out and then around fall and i literally drew the entire thing all the the original long comic in my mm. sketchbook in like one day, like kind of at lunch while I was at school. And then every day I just finished a page and posted it online. And this was between episodes one and two of um, the return of harmony or whatever it's called. Mm. And uh, so, yeah. And I just posted it in between the episodes and then it got really popular and it was weird and I didn't understand what was happening. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I remember um, when it got, like, linked around and people are going crazy for it. I love the Discord panel when he, like, turns evil. It's great. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now they made him not evil, so uh, there goes my plan. I know, yeah, right? They, What's with that? Gotta, you gotta do, like, a sequel to your... <laughs> <laughs> nah. Um, I, was actually, I was actually working on a uh, prequel, but, again, I have no time. <laughs> Yeah. And I have so many other projects that I want to be doing. I wish I could just clone myself, and that would solve <laughs> most of my problems. <laughs> Send your clone off to do all of your uh, schoolwork. Well, we both do schoolwork, and we collaborate, you see. Uh, uh, <laughs> okay. So, I just uh, picture a bunch of cosmic unicorns going, like, art, <laughs> art, 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 <laughs> art, just everywhere. Basically. Uh. <laughs> so, um, can you explain to us a little bit about uh, your art your history with art, uh, how you grew up? Because you, you mentioned that you, that your your mom was a landscape uh, artist, and uh, so how did you get started with art? Was it a family thing? Um, well, I decided to pursue art because I decided that it was the only thing I could do, so I should probably work on it. <laughs> um, I was a C student in high school and uh, didn't really care about school so much. Thought it was kind of dumb waste of time mm. you know school bureaucracy oh, we'll um no. i have a two-year degree um but my mom is a professional artist and my dad is an optometrist and uh, so that's how i grew up hmm. and i'm an only child so i'm all sorts of weird and uh <laughs> art so i don't know I've, I've just kind of always been drawing um my mother made a point to never tell me like color within the lines or she, you know, she never really told me what to draw. She just kind of let me do whatever Forget I wanted. Yeah. She just let me do whatever I wanted. And, um, 
yeah, and then when I was about, when I was about 18, I was like, I should probably choose what I want to do as a career. <laughs> so uh, I went to Future Poly because I was thinking, well, the only career that seems viable with art for me right now would be video game art. So I went to Future Poly to see if I like that, and then I was like, okay. And so I decided to re- enroll in art school, and so now I'm going to Gage Academy in Seattle, and I'm loving it. And uh, but now I'm falling in love with painting, so. Uh, I don't know how video <laughs> games are going to work out. <laughs> no, that's the life of a learning artist, yep. though, is constantly changing your major, changing what you think you'll be. Mm-hmm. Mm. What are some so. of the job opportunities for artists out there besides, say, video gaming? Because as someone who's not at all an art student, um, I have really no idea. Obviously, there's there's independent work, but uh, what other stuff is, yeah, is out know, there? Yeah, you know, freelance, I, I prefer to be freelance, honestly. I mean, it's really hard to be freelance, but... I don't know. It's I don't like working with people. So. <laughs> and I mean, and like on this video game that I'm working on, like I'm in charge of everything, and I still have to answer to some people, and it's it's difficult for me sometimes because I'm like I'm in charge, but not really, and I don't know. I like creative control, and I know that I have to surrender that um, sometimes. But as for other art careers, um, you know, video game art, there's illustration, there's you could be a comic artist. Um, graphic designer, painter. I mean, there's a whole plethora of things. I don't think that it's a good idea to just pick one. I think you should just, like, as an as- aspiring artist, should just work on their art skills overall and then just do whatever comes up because that seems to be how it works is that you're just going along learning stuff and then opportunities, you discover opportunities um, that may not be what you originally planned. Um, and it's usually a good idea to just go with it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, a lot of the time I hear with um, with people who choose art as a career, uh, you know, there's obviously that um, I'm not sure, uh, not stereotype or joke, but there's there's some sort of reoccurring joke with people, you know, you know, parents going, oh my goodness, my kid's gonna be an art student or whatever, you know, never have a yeah. job or whatever. <laughs> uh, so I think that's that's good advice because um, there's a little bit of truth to that. It's difficult to find jobs because it's not only a competitive environment, but there's not. A tremendous amount of opportunities not quite like you know say t- business right mm. um, well there's too many businessmen so <laughs> yeah it's one of those it's one of those um it's one of those jobs that you have to you have to really love because because it's going to be hard yeah you have to you have to own it is what you have to do you really have to take charge be your own boss yeah because it, it is good it, it, it is it is tough and it's something that you have to really take an initiative on. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Um, you can't kind of delegate responsibility to other people. You just have to take control of everything and just be organized and, you know, learn what you need to learn because it all comes down to your basic art skills. And But that's the great thing about art careers is that, you know, if you have an awesome portfolio, that it speaks for itself. So you know, you can get hired. You don't necessarily need a degree. Yeah. But Even in the art world, it's all about selling yourself. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Oh, definitely. So, um, we brought you on uh, partially, well, mostly because you're a fantastic artist and you have a lot to you have a lot to teach us and you have a lot to teach the people who watch our show. But um, specifically, we have a couple of points that have come up in the last few weeks that we thought we would bounce some ideas off of you okay. because um, we would like to have someone who is more well versed you know in, has form, yeah. formal education <laughs> in, in things in, in order to give a more definite um opinion on these subjects because a lot of the times uh, the thing the thing with us is um we can there's not a lot of definite um statements with us because we're not all formally educated and we're not all you know very uh, very in-depth about things and so we want to provide the basics to people but when it comes to more detailed stuff we are very careful about that because we can be very wrong so the the very first um thing that was brought up in the last few weeks was uh was value and we talked about that a little bit earlier um but we just i just wanted to kind of get kind of get from you a definition of value and, and how it can affect a piece because we just wanted to kind of close out on that topic and make sure everyone understands it properly. <laughs> All right then. Um, so value basically refers to the range of black and white tones, like grayscale tones, um, and it provides the substructure of color. So think of a black and white photograph. 
I mean, it's basically the color is there, but then it's not there because it's black and white. It's been grayscaled. And um, light is the prerequisite for value. And uh, so in order to have value, you need light. And in order to have color, you need you also need light. And so there's this chain of kind of things that you need to think about when you're doing a painting. And uh, value is really important because it is the light. And so if you get the value wrong, then your colors are going to look completely wrong. And you can't save your painting if your values are completely wrong. So um, I don't know if that makes sense or... Yeah, well, that, that makes, makes perfect yeah. sense. That was way better than the confounded <laughs> definition that I tried to throw together. But I think it echoed uh, our general statement at yeah, the very end of the yeah. day. Just much more well put. Okay. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and condensed, that's for sure. How does value differ from like a digital medium versus a traditional? It's the like, same. Medium? It's the same. It's just um, it's color without hue, and hue is color, so it's color without color, basically. I mean, so color you color can't exist with, without light. I mean, that's that's physics. So. I mean, the the fact that you can see anything and that there's color, that's optics, that's, you know. And yeah. so... Mm-hmm. Well, mm-hmm. speaking... No, speaking of, like, lights and stuff like that, it's actually a perfect transition into our second part of that question was we mentioned... Uh, or no, one of our fans mentioned... Uh, what was his name again? Detomne. Detomne, yes. that's right. Detomne happened to mention... Um, an awesome fan of ours happened to mention uh, that we always talk about the red, blue, yellow, like the traditional painting uh-huh. color wheel. And he mentioned that the RGB color wheel, uh, the color or the colors that you would see on a monitor, how colors work digitally, might be a better um, color wheel to use when talking about art and digital um, medium. That's, that's and fair enough. So yeah, that's correct. You, you mentioned um, how value is like the presence of light. Uh, does that tie into how RGB works? Is like it's a uh, additive color, correct? Where it all color, all colors, color create a is white color. Or... Doesn't I mean? And then depending on the medium that you're working in, um, that that changes kind of how you might think about color. RGB is digital media, um, red, green, blue, which is mm. the colors of the pixels that make up your monitor. And then the red, yellow, blue is your traditional painting color colors which are the primaries and then the idea Mm. that they're primaries is that you can create all the secondary colors from those primaries but since you know rgb you're in a computer you don't need to mix color you don't necessarily need to use the ryb the the red yellow blue palette thingy so Mm -hmm. that's what was curious to me because uh for like talking about a monitor digital uh when you have all the presence of red, green, and blue, it creates it creates a white. It creates yeah, white on your that's, monitor. That's, so that's when you look light. at so RGB refers to light, yeah. and then the red, yellow, blue, mm. um, traditional primary colors refers to pigment. So that's paint and ink and things like that. Yeah, and when you mix them instead of a white, it creates a black um, or mud. Yeah, basically. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> See, the, one of the one of the issues that Detomne had was uh, our use of the word complementary. And uh, our use of specifically the the RYB um, color wheel. Any 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 one on a lot of things about how the RYB color wheel is very outdated and shouldn't be taught and blah 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 <clears throat> and a bunch of things like that. But um, it was a good point to bring up just to have it on the show. Um, the different like, can you confirm this? Like there there are depending on which color wheel you're using, like whether or not it's digital using light um, a light based color wheel like uh, RB, RGB um, and the other co- color wheel RBY. Um, but there are different complementary colors depending on which medium you're using it in, correct? Um, like different complementary colors? or Well, for example, um, you know, when you're thinking of the traditional color wheel, you know, with, with if you're painting um, RBY, mm-hmm. um, then red and green would be considered complementary colors. Yeah. That's what everyone's taught in, that's what everyone in, who's taken any basic, you know, grade eight art class has been taught. That's what mm-hmm. is is a generally accepted piece of knowledge. But what Detomne is trying to bring up is that if we're talking about a digital medium, then red and cyan would be the complementary colors, not red and green. True. So it, that, that, does, that does hold some weight then? Well, he's probably talking um, about a Yermby wheel, which is RGB, red, green, blue, with cyan, magenta, and yellow. And that's yeah. considered a more universal color wheel. Um, mm-hmm. But complementary basically just means 
you know, you have a color and the complement would be the color that's across the color wheel from it. So kind of it's opposite. I like to think of it as the opposite. Complementary is a stupid word. I don't know why they use that word. It makes it sound like they're supposed to go together, but really they're actually opposites. And I don't know. It's Thank like, you. That's what I said. It drives, it drives me crazy. Opposites still go nicely yes, together. Yes, exactly. And that's why they are complementary, but it's still confusing. Oh, really. So I don't It's know. still confusing. Those artists, what do they, what do they know? <laughs> yeah, right. Uh-huh. But I just wanted to bring that up because it, it, it was it was an interesting point that was brought up. Um, the fact that, you know, on a computer screen, you know, if we're making something in a digital medium, the red and green, which are traditionally known to be these complementary colors, are in fact not. So th- does that change how people should be creating um, art if they're using a digital medium? Like, is, is, it, is it a big difference? Um, it's all in terms of how you think about it. Um, if you're going to be painting with pigments, you might not want to think about it that way because pigments work differently than light. Um, I think the Yermby wheel refers more to colored light, um, which makes more sense with digital mediums, but pigments can get complicated. You know, you have to consider like warm colors and cool colors and things like that. But um, I don't know, digital medium, it's, it's kind of more straightforward, I think, than than pigments mm. but mm-hmm. that is one of the things i had a hard time wrapping my head around was that in the red blue yellow color wheel it's like there's this color and it has an opposite and that opposite acts a certain way so then when there's like oh there's another color wheel and it has a different opposite it's like do certain colors have different quote-unquote opposites and i thought it was just confound to be like well when you're looking at a computer, red's opposite is blue, and I was just like, shenanigans. Well, I mean, you can think about it in terms, like, even if you combine them, like, okay, the opposite of red is green, right? Which is a general rule. It's not cyan. For paint, anyways. But, um, so if you have a red and then the opposite of, um, orange is blue, I believe. And so if you have a red-orange, the opposite would be kind of a, a green-blue. So they mix together, too. So. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's Hmm. Yeah, and when uh, when you're talking about the traditional color wheel, when you end up mixing a color's complement or opposite, it tends to gray it and make it more of a neutral color. It, it neutralizes it, it, yes. Depending. But on the computer, I don't know if um, that it's, works. It still yeah. kind of works. It's just, you know, different because of the, how the pixels in your brushes in Photoshop or whatever program you're using mm. work. Um. But because like if you if you make a brush that has texture in it and like you can see through it a little bit um, and allow mm-hmm. some of the color behind it, you know, like if you put down orange and then you use a brush with blue and you make it a textured brush and you can still see some of the orange through the blue, you know, mm-hmm. you can do it like that and it will still give you this scintillating effect because your eye reacts to orange and blue a certain way and it really makes it vibrate in your brain kind of. Mm-hmm. So, speaking along those terms, does that still work when using oh, color course. traditionally? Or is it better to mix, like, red and blue, for example, and digitally? Um, it all depends on what you're trying to achieve. I mean, I don't, I don't know how to answer that completely, but um, <laughs> yeah. it's, it's a case... I was just confused, because it's like, if you have, like you were saying, how orange and blue kind of counteract each other like that, um, when working digitally, do you want to take, like, the... Um, the traditional complement when you're trying to neutralize something or however put or do you want to take the RGB? I, I, I honestly with digital mediums I personally work as closely to traditional mediums as possible like I try and mm-hmm. pretend and make my techniques um, <laughs> more towards the, the traditional painting spectrum because it helps me mm-hmm. think about art in general because you know if I try to think of art in terms of the computer program I think it kind of slows me down a little bit and creates more problems. But if I just think of it in terms mm-hmm. of like one artistic language kind of thing, it makes it a little easier for me. Um, but, you know, your color relationship and color is something I'm still learning a lot about. It's a huge topic, so don't take my word as <laughs> final because I don't know everything. Oh, yeah. Um, no, is this something interesting that um, a fan of ours uh, brought up? So, A lot about color depends on the relationships between warms and cools and how you use those in your painting. So you could have a warm red and a cool red, or a warm blue and a cool blue, and then you know how you layer those next to each other or whatever you do with them um, is a large mm-hmm. part of how color works. 
Okay, cool. Hmm. I think there's. I think it's legitimate. I think it's legitimate to say that even though on a technical level, um, red and cyan would be opposites on the color wheel in a digital medium. I think there's still there's still an effect you get from putting green and red uh, well, as a traditional complement. You can see the 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 opposite color, basically complementary color. If like if you stare at something red. You know, for a really long time, and then you look at like a white surface. You can see the complementary color in your own eyeball. Like it will leave an imprint image. Like have you ever mm. seen the? Have yeah? Have you ever seen that famous painting of like the American flag, and it's like all in really weird, crazy colors, and you're supposed to yeah. stare at it for like 30 seconds, and then you look at a, like a white screen or a white surface. Yeah, yeah. and then it makes it. That yeah, and then color. it makes it the actual. Um, when you're working. Mm-hmm. Oh, you know, when you're on a monitor, um, that's what, what happens is if you stare at something that's red on a monitor and then the screen goes white, it'll be blue. So the color complement you see on a monitor will be the uh, complement on the RGB color wheel. But traditionally speaking, if you stare at something in the real world and stare at white, I don't know if it'll be the same. I'm not Test sure. Out. <laughs> oh, I'm sure. Anyway, um... Do, 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 do. Let's move along from color point. because, yeah, oh my goodness. We could talk uh, forever oh, about um, color. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, that ties in uh, another point that a uh, fan brought up on our YouTube page uh, was I mentioned that warmer colors have the tendency to seem closer and cooler colors have the tendency to seem far away. Is that yeah, correct? Yeah, that's correct. Um, what I ended up being wrong about, however, was I said r- warm colors have a quicker frequency. Um, so they tend to get to your eye quicker, but that's false because all light travels at the same speed, <laughs> and it turns out that red has a longer yeah, wavelength, wavelength than yeah. something like cool colors mm-hmm. do. So longer wavelengths seem closer, yet closer together wavelengths seem far. I don't know physics, what, <laughs> whatever. Yeah, honestly, I think at that point, at that point, we. I, I believe I was arguing with you about that before the show, and then you brought it up, and I was just like, forget it. Because like you were insinuating that red got to the eye first, and I was like, "What?" <laughs> I, yeah, I remembered the the term that the teacher was talking about of how like wavelengths will interact with your eye differently, and I just that was what I had taken out of it. But yeah, I got that it makes backwards. sense to me. And 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 saying that saying that warmer colors might might you know through the perception yeah, in our head sh- pop out. It's more. like flames on a car. Well, red no, makes light go really fast. Light light is a particle. So I mean, if you're looking at like. <laughs> Uh, the horizon, something way off in the distance, it's going to seem bluer or, you know, let more lavender because, you know, it's further away and it takes a longer time for the light to actually reach your eye. And then in between all that distance is a bunch of air and things like that. And the particles, you know, kind of get, you know, distorted. Yeah. And so it appears more, the light will appear more blue because it's further away. And then if something's closer, less distance, so it'll appear redder. And uh, so, you know, in landscapes, you're going to want to consider to keep your, you want to consider keeping your foreground more on the warm side and then your background, your distance background more on the cooler side, except during like the golden hour kind of times, which is like sunset and sunrise where the sun is off in the horizon and then things in the foreground will be um, darker and then things in the distance will be redder and and what have you. we brought up a piece by Aaron JVL uh, recently when we were talking about value, and uh, I'm going to attempt to find it here. But basically, what it used was it used um, it used value in a very opposite way because um, I believe I'm not sure if you agree with this. I could be completely wrong on this, but um, uh, things with things with a higher amount of value, uh, things that are brighter, tend to stand out and, and, and kind of come forward the same way that things that are in warmer colors come forward compared to cooler colors. Uh-huh. So we were looking at that, and, and what Aaron JVL did. Um, was he made something really, really cool with a Fluttershy piece, which I'm trying to find now, but it's very hard to when I'm talking. <laughs> um, but but he made something where he, he made a, a light like clearing surrounded by this kind of um, darker forest, and so almost like you were looking through the you were looking through the trees in order to see the piece inside. Here, it's called Nature fine. by Aaron JVL. Thank you. Yep. Um, <laughs> but anyways, he's kind of got the, the darker things, kind of like a ring around the lighter piece um, in the back. So does color kind of work the same way where if you if you surround a warmer color in cooler colors, um, it'll pop it backwards if you, if you do it correctly, obviously? It'll make it pop forwards. Um, 
Yes, or it'll just make it pop in general, I, I suppose. I mean, it really, I would have to see the piece to know what you're talking about. It's in the it's in the chat. You should. Oh, is it? Oh, right. there's a little Skype oh. chat. Yeah, th this one this one demonstrates value a little bit better. But uh, in in that piece, at least to me, anyways, um, I see. Uh, with the darker trees, um, mm -hmm. that's weird. With the darker trees, it it it, it seems like those trees are a lot closer, and then yeah. and then those darker trees kind of force uh, the light that's back. That's value yeah. in action there, and with value, things that are closer to you will be darker, and then things that are further away from you will be lighter or have less value, kind of more um, mid-tones or, you know, just lighter in general. Mm. So. Oh. And again, that's, um, that's just like a, what's the word I'm looking for? A, God, I can't, I mean, no, words are hard. <laughs> um, mental thing, what is the term I'm looking for? I, uh, words? I don't even speak English. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can't even. Here? I can't even attempt to pick up the pieces of that fracture sentence. What is the word for mental stuff? That your is perception of the something. Your what? Psychological. Thank you, Pinky. Daddy. <laughs> Perfect timing. How did timing. you possibly? How did you? How did you? How did you possibly? This is why I love you. <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, I mean the the idea of. The idea of using like dark in the foreground and then lighter in the background, I mean, that exists. If you look outside, you know, and look at something, the things that are closest to you will be, will have a darker value because, you know, there's more shadow or whatever. I mean, unless the sun is behind mm. you, I guess, but um, yeah. generally. Um, that's what I was trying to say is it's more psychological. I mean, you can, like, even in front of your monitor, if you put your hand in front of your face, in front of your monitor, your hand is going to be darker, mm -hmm. so on and so forth. And that happens a lot in real life. Yes. Well, that's because your and monitor so is emitting light burned in your hand, isn't it? But <laughs> well, whatever it's a you're looking at, most of the time emits light, so. It, it reflects light. It reflects light. Yeah, there you go. And reflected light is anyway. a huge part of color and value and things like that. Yeah, we tried to get into that a little bit in our lighting episode about like how colors and light reflect off things and how they interact with so on and so forth. So you can check that out for a lighting episode. Hey, <laughs> a nice plug. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Another so plug is we mentioned atmospheric perspective and how uh, Cosmic Unicorn is saying the particles of like the air get in the way. Um, that is part of our weather episode, actually. So if you want to hear a little bit more about atmospheric perspective, you can check out our weather episode. You're just full of plugs <laughs> today, aren't you? My yeah. goodness. <laughs> <laughs> so Cosmic so, Unicorn, mm -hmm. um, it's very, it, it's impossible, in fact, to attempt to say that some piece of art is is the most important part but if you if you could say to someone who is trying to learn the most about art what what would you say is is something that they should really look into maybe something that's underrated that not a lot of people know about and don't say value please <laughs> um something say that value. an aspiring artist should consider um draw yes. every day draw every day um, and know that there is no such thing. I tell this to everybody. There's no such thing as a bad drawing. It is impossible. So don't get hung up over whether your work looks good or not. Because today's bad drawing is going to help you create tomorrow's good drawing. And tomorrow's good drawing is going to be next year's horrible drawing. So it's a sliding <laughs> scale. And you just think of every quote unquote bad drawing is just going to help you become a better artist. And that no drawing is not is, is worthless as long as you learn something from it. It doesn't matter what it is, as long as you learn something from it, it was a valuable drawing and it makes you a better artist. So yeah, I like to think of it in terms of of, of that, you know, and that mistakes are good and they tell you what you need to work on and things like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's definitely great. We 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 try to encourage people as much as possible to um, go out there and just do because you know we talk about we talk about theory a lot. That's we don't draw on this show. We we talk about theoreticals and 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 um, different things that people can use to to potentially uh, make their art more diverse or uh, well, I'm not gonna say better, yeah. but well, improve. Um, add, add more elements to their repertoire. Improve. Hopefully, yeah. introduce them to things. Mm -hmm. that, yeah, mm -hmm. and um, but you know, at the end of the day, like you got to go out and do because you can sit here and listen to our podcast and then sit down and you're going to be the exact same as if you hadn't, um, if you hadn't haven't practiced, done. you know, <laughs> mm -hmm. if, if you haven't practiced. It's, so. it's that age old mantra that practice makes perfect. You know, it, 
it really works. You know, I, <laughs> I had a kendo sensei who would say that practice is not does not make perfect. Perfect practice makes perfect because it doesn't uh, matter if you practice something and do it wrong because all you're going to learn is how to do it wrong, basically. So um, <laughs> do whenever you draw, just do the best that you can and really put your heart into it. But then at the same time, you know, kind of give your... Always look at it as a way to improve. Yeah, and be more objective about your work. Don't don't compare mm -hmm. yourself to others. Like, I see artists, and, you know, I'm guilty of it too, and I'm trying to not do that, and I've gotten better at it. But stop comparing yourself to other people. Like, those are other people. That's their work. It's not you, and you are not your work. I mean, it's, it's your work is just it's just something you do. It's not your personality. It's not, you know, it's... It's a part of you, but yeah. it's not you. Kind of, it's hard. It's hard to explain, you. you know. And because if you if you connect yourself too much to your work, you know, it makes it difficult for you to take criticism or critiques, and then you take it personally, and then yeah. you mm -hmm. get all worried about it, and then you don't get anywhere because you're too upset about it or anything, you know, or something like that. And so mm -hmm. I think it's important to uh, to not compare yourself to others, to look at others and admire their work, and you know, ask yourself, what can I do? You know, I really like this person's work, but what can I do, you know, that would make my work better, just like their work? Kind of like, what kind of techniques do they use that I could maybe borrow, you know, and to kind of, you, know, you just borrow techniques from everywhere and you just kind of mush them all together and then you have your own methods. Mm -hmm. and, you know, that's how it works, basically. Mm -hmm. I think, anyway. So, well, that's, that's, de that's definitely good because especially when you're looking at other artists, you don't, all you're seeing is the finished product. You don't know what went into it and what what goes into it is not only when they made it, but also perhaps they have 12 more years of practice than you have or maybe <laughs> they're doing it professionally for so many more years than you have and, and oh, or, yeah, or maybe they're looking at their own piece and they're going, wow, this is awful. Like, <laughs> yeah. like a lot of people do, you know? So We kept offering blitz pony all these compliments just like oh, i hate this art piece it's so bad it's like, it looks beautiful yeah blitz pony was definitely down on her art um but i think she's getting more up to it because she's finally starting to put stuff on dvr which is fantastic yeah it's awesome mm -hmm. yeah i think being down on yourself doesn't really get you anywhere i think it's important to recognize mm -hmm. what is not working in your artwork but then it's also important to recognize what is working in your work so i mean if you're always beating yourself up all the time you're just kind of you know, beating yourself up, you're not really getting anywhere. It's not it's not improvement, it's not moving forward, it's just you feeling bad about yourself and how does that make you a better yeah. artist? It doesn't, so stop it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, <laughs> we we love seeing um things like time lapses or uh speed draws or stuff like that or works in progress. Um just because, you know, it, it gives people a kind of a starting point or ideas. A sense of how process, you know, in like an art piece works. Yeah. It's all about process. <laughs> actually more and more people um who we've featured on the show or or perhaps i think a lot of the people in our fan art we, we've we've kept trying to encourage people to do that because i think it's it's a, a great learning tool um to see how how people uh get from get from blank blank canvas to to end product because it's, it's very intimidating for a lot of people starting out to to look at uh, and, like if people were to look at a piece of yours and be like well i'll just never do that but it, perhaps if they see the process they can say okay well i can try something and, and see where i get with that so we've always encouraged people to do that and i'm actually seeing a lot of other people um i know assassin monkey was one of our fans who uh who was already doing that and um there's a couple of other people who are now making time lapses with like each and every one of their art pieces and i cannot encourage that enough <laughs> I, I really not only as an educational but an entertainment value too yeah no it's not only awesome as like a learning device but it's also awesome as a way to critique upon someone's like um it's really for process and how they go about doing something as well, mm -hmm. yeah. especially if you're a new artist. Yeah, that's, that's mm -hmm. something I want to do more of, but um, trying to figure out video recording things and screen recording things <laughs> is uh, part of the problem, so... Well, yeah, try a live kinda, stream, actually. Yeah, <laughs> Just get, like, a live stream that no one knows about, <laughs> and then, and then it, 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 can, it can record it for you. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, kind of going back on that and, and kind of going full circle back to your critiques... Um, like I personally find those very helpful because um, it kind of shows the process that that's going through well your mind when you're looking at an art piece or analyzing an art piece, um, yeah, and there's always you know helpful tips and hints and stuff like that, which is really helpful for people who are just starting out. Even on the critique that you did for me, like you showed the traditional way of how you would go about starting the process of a painting, 
like a traditional well, yeah, painter, and, you like, know, started out, did the value, and and like how you approach, and that's the thing too between mediums, like the art rules, basically the art principles, like value and how color works, and those kinds of things, is basically the same no matter what you're doing, no matter what medium you're using, whether it's traditional or, or digital. Um, hmm. But how you start a painting and how you you know work with the medium varies and it changes. So like you can't, I mean. I, my technique for digital and traditional is, is kind of the same because that's how I work. But I mean, some people might have different approaches and you might not, not necessarily want to do an oil painting the same way you do a digital painting or, you know, you mm. might want to think about it. The way that I showed you in your, in your critique that I did for you was a very, very traditional kind of classical way to start an oil painting mm. where you do a grisaille painting, which is a monochromatic version of the image first and that's to establish your value range and everything else mm -hmm. and then you put color on top of it and that's the classical way to do it you know that's how the old masters along with all those dead old guys did it you know like, like yeah, da Vinci and you know Vermeer and Rembrandt and those kind of guys um, awesome. they would do you know a monochromatic painting and then add color on top of it and part of that was that paint was really expensive back then they had to make all their own paint by themselves and it was super yeah. expensive and but brown was relatively cheap, relatively cheap because they could use things like clay um so they would do the, the yeah. underpainting and then put the color on top and it was efficient and efficiency is one of the things i try and kind of use as a as a huh. core element to how i learn about art is like what is the most efficient way to learn this what is the most efficient way to practice this that kind of thing which is why I like do Very pony cool. paintings and then practice art things at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> right. Efficiently fun. That's awesome. Yep. Not only that, but a cool thing I learned was um, when you use like a brown or something, it gives it a warm undertone, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. where, if, where if you were to use like a blue or something for your monochromatic underpainting, it would give it more of a cool tone when you put colors over it. Well, yeah, and that's another huge part of it that I'm learning about right now is that your underpainting with real paint, you know, um, really affects how your the paint that you put on top of it like i did this landscape painting a few weeks ago and i learned that you know if you want to do a sky and paint you paint the canvas orange first and if you paint it orange first and then you put your blue on top you wait for it to dry and then you put your blue on top of it it'll make your blues look warmer and that's how the sky looks i mean if you look at a nice blue sky it looks actually kind of warm huh. and you know you put your blue on top of it and then it makes the blue kind of scintillate and vibrate a little bit and it makes it look more alive and more sky like and then it also makes your clouds warmer and um that's that's an example cool. of how you know an underpainting can affect your final painting kind of thing and, hmm. and you mentioned before that you use a lot of uh traditional techniques uh -huh. when digital painting so you know so things like that um, I think people should look into more. Yeah, well, like with digital, I do the underpainting as well. But instead of doing kind of like the brown paint, because brown also dries really fast, um, umber and sienna and those kinds of colors dry really fast. But for digital painting, um, when I do an underpainting kind of thing, I will choose a color that will unify the scene, kind of like the one color that will be the dominant mood color, the mood setting color. And I'll do the, I'll do it in kind of a desaturated version of that color so usually like a, a grayish purple or a grayish blue you know whatever and then it will kind of set the tone for the entire for the rest of the colors in the painting well just to grasp that a little bit more um as an example did you use that technique in this recent uh gift you just made for two of your friends um i did it for the stranger one the one titled stranger yeah. let's see if i can grab that so we can throw it on the screen um, but just an ex as an example for Stranger, what unifying color did you happen to use, just so it's easy for us to um, kind of, sort of a, grasp that concept? Sort of a rusty brown color, I think. Yeah. So basically the overall tone of kind of what the piece mm -hmm. is? Pretty much. I mean... <laughs> okay. Hmm. All right. Well, unfortunately, hmm. we are running out of time. Um, so does anybody have any burning questions or Cosmic Unicorn, do you have any... Um, bits of essential knowledge for anyone listening um i don't know that's that's a intense question there i don't know <laughs> it, it is it is it's a loaded question anything that stands out to you at this moment they said oh man before i go i should say this or i really wish i said that you know <laughs> brent says it a lot um yeah. i don't know just 
draw every day really if you want to be a better artist mm. draw every day that's, that's yeah. what I, I, I think I, I think I can go with that because it's been echoing what I was saying. So when someone who is obviously much more educated than me confirms my opinion, I get to pr- <laughs> I get to prance around a little bit, <laughs> do a little twilight dance, yeah, uh, <laughs> stick the tongue out and everything. Well, yeah. draw efficiently, I guess would be would be my version of okay. it. Draw efficiently every day. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, well. Right. The last little bit uh, that I would like to say is uh, it was awesome seeing at you. It was awesome seeing you at Everfree Northwest, and yes. I appreciate I all will the things be back. that you had for yes, sale there. I will actually be there. back. Um, I was able to get a table. Thank you to the yeah. Everfree team. Awesome. They're amazing. Yeah. I love them all. <laughs> They're mm-hmm. awesome people. Yeah, you're having some trouble with that. Um, so, okay. come you find their me. con book, so they owe you. Yeah, yeah. no, we'll definitely, we'll all be there. Um, or at least three of us will be there. Um, but but we'll all try to get out there and, and uh, hopefully we'll come out there and meet you in person and say thank you for being on our show. But for now, yeah. I'm going to say thank you for being on our show yes. because you're a wonderful guest and very insightful. And, and I think a lot of people will be able to learn from this episode, which is what we kind of go for, <laughs> which is awesome. Yeah. So right now... Um, so my, my, internet, my internet's working perfectly now. Oh, yeah. So Piggy Dash, uh, just in time, can you do the plugs? Wait, wait, wait. First, uh, let's let Cosmic Unicorn plug herself uh we know you oh that's you have, a very good point you have a deviantart account yeah um and people can go there it's cosmicunicorn.deviantart.com but do you have anywhere else that people can like find your art or um or anything else you'd like to plug no yeah. that's pretty much where where i am on the internet i also have a tumblr um cosmic unicorn scribble and that's just kind of my online kind of sketchbook where i just post all sorts of random things um a, sort of i post a lot of things from school like stuff that i'm working on at school, things I'm doing at school, and uh, mm, rants cool. I have, or whatever, you know, just my brain, basically. <laughs> it's just a dumping ground for all cosmic unicorn. Brain. <laughs> right. Yeah, that's great. Cool. All right, all right now, well, now plugs. Pinky Dash. Now, Pinky Dash, can you do the plugs now that your internet's okay. working perfectly fine? Okay, I, it, it, it's not exactly working perfectly, but just keep in mind, I am doing them, so if you can't hear me, I'm still doing them anyway, all right? <laughs> oh, good. Okay, so, plug starting now. We have a DeviantArt account, which is cutieartcrusaders.deviantart.com. That's where you can go to see any of our previous episodes, all the art that we've featured on the show, some stuff that we haven't, so stuff that we haven't had time to show or just, just didn't fit in with the theme, etc., etc. It's all in our favorites folder, like the whole heap of folders in there. Just go through, have fun, watch everyone. Um, we also have an email account, which is cutieartcrusaders at gmail.com. Um, if you have any questions to send in for me, please do, because I'm running out. Um... It's also the place to go to send in our anything for our OC episodes coming up, which I'm sure Rainbow Plasma will want to talk about. We'll get to that in a second. Yep. Um, it's also if you've got anything you want us to feature. So if you've got if you've had a look around and you say, "Oh, okay, this this it's the thing that you guys are having next week," which again Rainbow Plasma will talk about later. You'll you can send it in to us, and we can have a look at it and possibly feature it on the show, even if it's not yours. If it's somebody else's, that's fine. And we also have some. Social media accounts, which I guess Flutter Guy will talk about since he runs Sure. Them. Um, we have a Facebook page, which is Key Dark Crusaders on Facebook. So, facebook.com slash Key Dark Crusaders. Uh, you can go there and like it. And um, yeah, we've gotten, I think it's up to 100 likes or something like that, which is phenomenal. Mm-hmm. We also have a Twitter account, which is at Key Dark Crusade. And there you can find pretty much all of the most up to date information. Like if we're having technical issues on the stream or anything like that, we'll post it there. Yeah. Okay, so one last thing before we go. Uh, we mentioned last week that we, we announced uh, we were having uh, an OC episode coming up in which you guys could submit art specifically for and that we're going to be using your art specifically for. So o- over the last week, um, I've been looking uh, at, at how we're going to be doing this and how it's all going to be run. And uh, I decided instead of trying to say it all right now in the middle of you know a podcast that's already running an hour long, um, it, we would do it badly every single week and people would be confused. So what we did was, uh, or what I did actually, was um, I made a journal post on our DeviantArt account. So again, that was deviantart.com slash Crusaders. I made a journal post there. And so go to that page. If you want to submit stuff, um, it has all of the information about when the episodes are, what they're going to be about, what you can submit for, the rules and the guidelines for for, for kind of stuff like that, the, the instructions on how to submit um, things like that. And you can also use that comment section to ask us questions in case you're confused about, um, say, 
you know, can I submit something that I already made? And, and we're like, mm, try not to. Um, <laughs> but so that, that's the journal you can go. That'll be in the description if you're on YouTube. Um, I'll try to post it in the chat if, if you're watching this live. But just head over to our DeviantArt page and head over to the journals and there should be you should be able to find it there. Uh, make sure you look at that before you submit stuff to us because we're getting some stuff from Pony Creator. And that is not what we're going for. <laughs> so yeah, don't please don't send us pony creator stuff. <laughs> yeah, we're just going, we're just we're just going to roll our eyes and move on. Um, not that your OC is badly designed, but we're looking for pieces of art that we can feature that yeah. also have good OCs and blah de blah de blah stuff like that. Anyways, that journal will give you all the information. So we're not we're going to stop talking about it. We're going to mention it each week, but we're going to stop going so in depth about it. And we look forward to what everyone is going to be sending in uh, in the coming weeks. Definitely. <laughs> yep. All right. Well, that is everything for us this week. This is episode 31, right? I think I got that right. Um, yes. Thank you, Cosmic Unicorn, for coming on again. You are a wonderful guest. No, oh, you're welcome. Uh, and uh, everyone should go check her out, of course, because she's got some fantastic pieces of art, many that we couldn't get to because we wanted to talk to her about more theoretical things. But um, trust me, she backs it up. <laughs> There's some great stuff on there. Yep. Her art and her critiques are an awesome place to find things to help you learn. Yes. Okay. Thank you guys for watching, whether or not you're on the live stream or on YouTube. We love you all the same. My name is Rainbow Plasma. <laughs> I'm Burned01. I'm Photoguy317. I'm Picky Dash. I am Cosmic Unicorn. And we'll see you guys next week. Bye. 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 Hello and welcome to the ninth spoiler cast for the Cutie Art Crusaders. We're covering the episode 11 of season 3, Just for Sidekicks. I am your host, FlutterGuy317, and today I'm joined by... Uh, Burned01, the Rambling Man. <laughs> and Rainbow Plasma, the, the Rambling Man? <laughs> I don't know. The Hockey the, Man? The, the Canadian. <laughs> Let's go with that. You're breaking the fourth wall. They're not supposed to know how I'm watching hockey. <laughs> <laughs> uh, secrets. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Right. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, Pinky Dash couldn't be here. He had things to do, and his internet was derping. So. Yeah, his internet was really bad today. Inter it's too bad. standard Australian joke. Okay. Boxing kangaroos. Yes. <laughs> you're, you're, like, running it into the ground now. It's like as, as As an aficionado cool. of running jokes into the ground, you are officially running it into the ground. What? what the boxing kangaroos? We need something new for PD. Uh, something with wombats. Thank you. See, look, wombat. Now that's creativity. Yeah. Next joke you make about Australia has to have wombats. In it. <laughs> I don't know a thing about wombats, though. All right. Anyhow, Anyways. so this episode... Um, didn't have wombats. <laughs> did not have wombats, no. Uh, it was very Spike-centric, but it was also burned. I think you put it before we started uh, recording. It was very pet-centric or yes. mm -hmm. sidekick-centric. It um, was a pet episode. Yeah. yeah. They hadn't had that since season two, so it was awesome. Yeah. This mm -hmm. episode was really pleasing to me. Not yeah, I um, like <laughs> we, <laughs> we we finally got some closure on um, Pee Wee. Yeah. At the beginning, which was yeah. nice. Like mm -hmm. I complained relentlessly our last spoiler <laughs> cast about the lack of continuity and whine whine complain, um, and then whined a little bit about Discord. But yeah, you this this lot. episode, like, there was freaking continuity. There was more than enough. Like even if it was just a lot of Spike, it. like mm -hmm. like cuddling the thing or whatever but i mean it actually had like the beginning and end and like him returning the friggin bird whatever his name is to its parents peewee Pee -wee. Pee -wee's parents yeah. i was like oh my gosh like that was more than any brony could ever ask for and like if you were unhappy with that then just, 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 you should yeah yeah no, it, was, it was it was definitely like enough closure to be like look we're not gonna bring it back suddenly so here's the reason why he hasn't been around you know mm -hmm. pot it's it's a post it's a it's it's a post explanation. Yeah, you know, so. and like the whole return, like reuniting the dude with his parents, that was awesome. Makes sense to me. And yeah, all the I, I he stole the egg, didn't he? Pictures were adorable. <laughs> like it was point of to be a pet centered episode. There was a lack of continuity there, and they connected it and got continuity. This episode yeah. Yeah, was so like this is the reason why for continuity. Uh huh. I, I love how Twilight like uh got upset at Pee Wee. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> In one of those photos. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 
Um, photos are cute for sure. Yeah, uh, I've taken the photos though. This this uh, this season has there's been like a lot of I don't want to call it pandering, but there's a lot of like oh no, it's pandering. Yeah, there's a lot of fan ideas that have been introduced into the show, but I mean that's not a bad thing. No. Um, because I mean if we're thinking about the ideas and saying oh hey this would be really awesome if they did this and then they did that you know they did it like. Yeah. All the fans and all the bronies were just like, oh my god, I wish they did this. And they basically, when they were making the season, were like, what should we do to please these fans and please people who like our show and enjoy our show? And they set out to make a show and straight up pander. And, like, that's more than any brony could ask for. Like, what should we do? Well, people want to see Discord come back. People want to do this, want to say that, blah, blah, blah. And they had everything, and I thought it was awesome. Like, sure, I wish they did some things differently than they did in the season, but... They still did them, and I think that's what's important, and that's what I've come to terms with. Yeah. Well, the thing is, like, there's a difference between... Look, at at all points, at all points in these episodes, I think that the people who were writing the show and coming up with the concepts of the show sat down and said, here's a list of the concepts that we want to explore this season, or other people want want us to explore this season, and let's build episodes around them. Mm -hmm. And I think that's perfectly fine, but there comes a point where... Certain episodes are done so well that you could not tell that the the episode was built around yeah, this one central that. idea. Yeah. I like to point out that as much as I don't like the character of Trixie, I thought the Trixie episode was done in such a good way that there's no way they just said, uh, Trixie, let's figure something out. Like, that episode <laughs> was very well done. Yeah. The thing that I... There are two things that I don't like about this episode. First of all, I just, the more and more I see of Spike, I just don't like him. (laughs) Honestly, as a character, he's just like, every single time I see him, it's just like, okay, like, can you get someone else on the screen? Like, I'd like to focus on them more. (laughs) It's not that he's like, he annoys me or anything. It's just, I just, I'm bored of him. Um, Maybe (laughs) it's me, maybe it's me being, maybe it's me being like 19 and like, he's acting like a kid. So it's like, get like, I'd rather see a cute pet or the ponies that I actually enjoy, you know? Yeah. Um, Anyway, so that was that was one aspect. I'll get into that a little bit more detail later if we have time. Well, in but argument against that, I kind of like when they have a character who's like kind of the opposite or role or like a minor character kind of changes feel in the show. Like, yeah, he has mm-hmm. that annoying kid feature and stuff. But I think that's nice. I think it's somewhat of an important quality of show, even if it's something for some people to hate or dislike. It's there, and like at the end of the episode, he came to terms and he grew up a little. And like yeah. in the future, if they ever make a nod to that, to where he grows up and matures and sit of the hat you know okay cool i was just saying with the actual point of that that was an aside okay. the mm-hmm. actual point of my statement was the thing that i didn't like about this episode is i felt like i felt like it looked like they built the episode around something that they wanted to show us and it's the same it's the same thing as last week's episode with discord i felt like last week's episode was like let's put discord in something and then they built an episode around oh. it and th- by the same reason they said this episode Let's bring back the pets, and let's build an episode around okay. it. Okay, I mean, mm-hmm. maybe that's not pandering to us. I mean, maybe that's just like even as far as making a good car- cartoon having continuity, like they in the first or the second season, they gave each character their own little respective pet, and like that was the thing. And it was like, it would just be what's the word? Not good if they didn't like actually <laughs> bring back it's, each. It's not, yeah, it's not right. a continuity. It's not a continuity error, burn. What I'm trying to say is. There's a difference between making it obvious that they're just saying, okay, we're going to bring these guys back because just for continuity's sake and saying, here's an episode and they're also in here. A lot of the continuity throwbacks that are in the background are done in that way where they're saying like, these are just extra things. I, but I just felt like, I just feel like this episode and I liked the episode and, and I thought it was very cute and I enjoyed seeing the animals and in no way am I saying, oh, they shouldn't have brought the animals back. I enjoy the continuity. <laughs> but it's not an issue of continuity. It's an issue of, I looked at the episode at the end and said there are many variables in this that could have changed and it does none of them really mattered like all that mattered is the pets was in them and then they just threw something together you know spike was just we've seen that lesson before he was an old lesson um it, they just made an episode about pets and threw some stuff in around it that's what i felt like this episode was yeah i mean I could kind of see that, but uh, at the same time, like you, you do need some filler episodes. Um, yeah, and there's nothing this, wrong with that. Yeah. but I just, I just, it was more apparent to me in this episode than any other episode. 
This was more filler than any other episode. And so far, this season has not been any filler. And in a 13-episode season, I think it's a bit disappointing to see very obvious filler. I don't feel that way. I I feel that's wrong to say. Um, And I I disagree with that point. I'm going to say I personally. What's wrong to say? But, like, just to say that it feels like filler, I just disagree with that point. Like, I thought it was a great episode. Not just, like, I know we both agree that we liked the episode. But I mean, is it not in the term that it was filler? In that it was an episode where there was a strict point in, like, the whole arc of things, having their pets. And it was an important point that they wanted to bring back in. And it wasn't filler. It was something that I personally feel needed to bring back in and was awesome to bring back in. And mm-hmm. I thought it made for a great episode. Regardless, like, Spike's been featured twice in this season. And, like, he fit nicely in the narrative and story that they were telling. But it, I still felt that it wasn't filter that it was, or filler. It was a perfectly good episode standalone, especially everything in it. Like, yes, it was a similar, um, what is the word I'm looking for? Um, moral that Spike learned in the end. But I never got the feeling of pandering that I got in the Discord episode. I was overall pleased at the feel and everything of this episode. I just, I, I guess I just disagree with the notion that this just seems like filler or just a random episode where they shove something in. It was more like there's an important aspect to our world here, which is the pets. <clears throat> the pets. And then we But I'm not to, saying the pets like, were anything to do with filler. I was just saying that and I think a lot of it's centered around Spike because Spike was not an interesting character in this episode. He was he was someone who has now repeated a moral choice. And what, like, that's not like, oh, he's a bad character or anything, because whatever. Like, he's a child, and children don't learn after mistakes, and they do a bunch of stuff, and they're greedy, and, and like, I, I get that. But it was just like, this episode was centered around Spike, and, I, and it's a combination of me not, like, I don't find Spike entertaining. <laughs> and then just like all of it was, it, it, all of the parts with Spike in it that had like all the parts that had to do with Spike, I feel like could have like they were that I feel like that was kind of thrown together. I don't think the pets were thrown together. I think they were done very well, and each pet had its own thing in the foreground and in the background, and the continuity was fantastic, but maybe it just all stems from the fact that I don't necessarily like Spike that much. And and it was the same thing with Spike at your service. It was mm. just like but even that one felt more like this is a new thing with Spike, whereas this was, I feel like it's just the same old, same old with a, with this episode. Yeah, but I feel Spike yeah. as a character is kind of a necessary evil, so to speak, because everyone's always <laughs> this perfect, you know, nice pony and nice character and nice whatever, and they, in a few episodes, take their little personality opposite, but that's a per- personality os- uh, aspect. As far as, like, being a bad person or a bad pony, so to speak, um, Spike kind of fits that role and he gets a lot of hate for that but he's really the only person who's not a villain who kind of fits that personality that some people may not like or disconnect with and I think he's the necessary evil so to speak what were... I like him better as the straight man he played the straight man to Twilight um, in season one and and I think in season two as well where Twilight was you know you know bookworm and kind of you know gets excited about things yeah. and spike would kind of roll yeah. his eye i really like the dynamic between twilight and spike was it last no it was spike at your service where at the very end he mm-hmm. comes back and you see them together and you're like oh they're really good together but like to me like that's spike outside of spike and twilight is like i just no i'm not i <laughs> I, I have not liked a spike like it's not like i haven't liked a spike centric episode but there's been no standout spike centric episodes and i just feel like this is the same to me this is a standout pet episode the pets stole the show yeah definitely yeah i mean see the thing is like uh with this episode i think spike has kind of grown up since um like as a character has kind of grown up slightly since spike at your service um because or even like since uh i'll i'll Aloysius or yeah, however you pronounce it, it. <laughs> um, just because like in the beginning when he's making the cake and stuff like that and he makes the remark about who could have taken his gems he realizes that it's him whereas like in the past I don't think he would have and you can definitely see like growth throughout the episode because he finally realizes that you know he has to be responsible so there is you know it might be repeating the same 
lesson over and over again, but I, it it ties it around an interesting story. I don't know. I enjoyed it. I suppose. I just feel like the interesting part of the story was not Spike. The interesting part was there. there is all these stories, and then the interesting part was there's pets with them, and I loved it, and I loved the pets, but like... I just feel like the general story was not that interesting. Anyways, let's move on to like the not the plot stuff. Like let's move <laughs> on to like some of the stuff we love. You know what I loved? Mm-hmm. I loved everything with Rainbow Dash in this episode. And that's yeah, not even Rainbow a Rainbow Dash, Dash bias. That just <laughs> like the the two things that happened in this episode were freaking adorable. They had the the tank licking her face and her, she had the, <laughs> a blushy scrunchy licky face. Mm-hmm. And and then and then she does that like quick like snuggle like snuzzle thing while nobody's looking that the, both those things were freaking adorable yep <laughs> and, and i want gifts of both of them <laughs> yep. get on it internet i think they've already done <laughs> go on reddit they're there <laughs> yeah there's a lot of that awesome stuff in the episode the whole time yeah. well made like gifts it. yeah mm. so as far as theme wise and like executing the cuteness wise and character interaction, especially with the main six, like, um, I thought that was really well played, especially with all their pets. Yeah. Really well done. Yeah, like, uh, AJ and Winona, like, everyone had their own pets and had their own personal. I love, I actually love the way that, um, Angel was portrayed in this episode because Angel's always kind of the antagonist, mm. but there was so, there was such a deep characterization of him that he's an antagonist even when he's with yeah, Fluttershy, he's... but when he's away from Fluttershy, he's <laughs> like, you know, I need to get back to like mommy. Yeah. And I thought that was such a cool character like thing to add yeah. because we haven't really seen a tremendous <laughs> amount of that before, but he was like desperate to get back to Fluttershine. I thought, yeah. I thought that was really cute and really mm-hmm. deep for his character. Yeah. Well, I mean, it fit nicely into the story about how. For sure. Blah, yeah. Blah, 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 what was it? Um, is that Spike was treating him wrong and, you know, he wanted to go back to, to <laughs> Fluttershine, whatever, whatnot. Mm-hmm. Moral. Yeah. I, I loved the, um, the styling whenever like angel would do something bad and spike would um get angry and go like angel <laughs> yeah <laughs> like it it, it was kind of reminiscent of like um i don't know maybe like a samurai jack or kind of look something like that yeah i can kind of see that yeah um, you lost me there <laughs> uh what is it <laughs> um oh yeah, no, your point about how Spike played the antagonist is awesome because he's, like, not really a villain, but he was constantly the one causing trouble and the one... Bunny. Blah, blah, blah. Bunny, excuse me. Bun- yeah, not Bunny. <laughs> Angel. Yeah. yeah. Oh, there you go. Sorry. But, yeah, no, he, yeah. he was an awesome villain-esque person in this episode, and he fit perfectly because <laughs> everyone has, in the, like, fandom, seems to have this, like, hatred towards him, like, he's this evil being, and so it was nice for them because he, he fit that role and he stuck with it. And then, but, I mean, he's still somewhat of a nice character at the end when he kind of like made up with spike there yeah. angel plays a angel plays a really nice, like i mentioned spike plays a good straight man and straight man means like if there's a joke going on they're the person to bring it back down to the reality mm-hmm. kind of drag him back down to reality angel angel occasionally plays a quite nice straight man to flutter chai damn it <laughs> almost just said your name again <laughs> um uh. a- angel angel plays a really good straight man to Fluttershy, I'm like in, in so like the first few episodes, where like where like um, you know, Fluttershy would be like they they were talking about the ticket, I, I believe, it, and and she was like, "Why are you cleaning my house?" Oh no, we're just doing some spring cleaning, and then the angel like looks at her and she's like, "No, we're doing it for the ticket." <laughs> like, that, that, I, I, yeah. I, I think I think that that straight man yeah. attitude yeah. works really well. Angel in general, like it's so uh, you can't help but love him. No matter what he does, you can't help but love him. Uh, if Mickey Dash were here, he would. No, have. but there's like, so, like he does, he does these, he does these things to like Fluttershy, and you're like, wow, what a jerk. And then he does something, and you're like, yeah, but they really love each other. Like, yeah. Like at the uh, end of the day, like all of this, like after this episode, you can't, like he, all this episode, he yeah. was just being a giant jerk. And then at the end of the episode, you're just like, yeah, you, you know, but you, you can't. You want to give him. Fluttershy uh, credit, but it's like. Like again, maybe sometimes Fluttershy gives people a little bit too much credit, but that's part of her character. So Angel Bunny fits uh, in that zone, I guess. Yeah, he has his place. I'm not gonna say I like him, <laughs> but <laughs> I think he's an awesome character. Uh, but he's a good character. I yeah, but because he is kind uh, of a caretaker. I, yeah. My favorite image of him is when uh, Cutie the McCutie Marcusaders go knocking on Fluttershy's door in uh, Ponyville Confidential. It's like, hey, is Fluttershy home? And, like, they look in, and it's Angel Bunny sitting there straight-faced with Fluttershy in the background just bawling her eyes out. 
and yeah. <laughs> slams the door in their face. It's like she's yeah, not okay. <laughs> like that. I, that's my favorite embodiment of his character. Yeah. Mm-hmm. If it's any. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. I'm I'm really glad they brought Tank back though. Actually, oh, it's M- moving on to the flying machine. Yeah. I know. Yeah, they made the 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 flying machine. It was run by magic. Yeah. yeah. Really cool. Also, Obviously, it was some sort of magic connected to him because it only worked when it was... I don't know. It's just like little touches like that that like... He, look, at the end of the day, we're watching a show about little ponies. Like, you don't have to be like, oh, how does that helicopter device work? <laughs> and, but magic. like, but at the same time, like, it's that extra effort. It's the extra effort to be like, look, there is something. It's like, oh, that's nice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, for a show and episode about magical prancing ponies and their cute little pets and the annoying little dragon... Um, I, I really enjoyed it. Like, as far as, like, overall opinions, I think my overall opinion was I really enjoyed it, and I thought it was a great episode to add to the season, and it really got over some of... It made me get over some of the nitpicks that I've had for the season so far, but what do you guys think? Yeah, I mean, I, I enjoyed it. It's not my favorite of the season, um, but I thought it was pretty good. Um, yeah, I don't know. We have 13 <laughs> episodes... And we've had two spike episodes, and that annoys me. Well, it's like in previous seasons, we maybe had one per season, so I don't know. We, I just, I'm, I'm a huge advocate for what they've been doing all season, which is more of the main six mm. in many scenarios. Yeah. And yes, they showed up in this one, and that's great. But there's, there's been two spike-centric episodes so far. And as someone who is not a very big fan of Spike, that disappoints me because, especially because this is a shortened season. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> well, I don't know. I've enjoyed when they brought him back in, and even if they're like and I bringing <laughs> the pets was like back in was their agenda. Like we really need to bring the pets back in episode. He fit the role for bringing the pets back in really well, especially in that whole story scenario that went down. In in my CMC could, CMC could have done it. They did a little bit, yeah. and their part in the episode was awesome. I know, but they could have been. Yeah, I'm like just saying, the straight up, could they could have been the person, anyone. the, pe- the yep. people who got the whatever, and all the junk went down, and blah blah blah. Yep, yep. And then other more skydiving sure, cutie sure, marks. Sure. Could, uh, I, I think <laughs> if you look back at this episode, uh, you could have replaced ninety percent of the parts of Spike with the CMC, and and sure, come up with some sort of other convoluted way. I'm sure, they had a good of reason them for ignoring using Spike though versus the CMC. There's like been a lot of CMC of episodes. Either. I just, um, I, just has, it's but, yeah. a personal thing. I don't like Spike because I haven't liked his episodes, and so <laughs> I don't know why you're laughing at me. I'm allowed to dislike things. Last week you, I know, <laughs> it's funny because I'm just trying to defend yeah. that I enjoyed Spike in the episode. So it's just funny that you don't laugh so at me when say. I say I don't like him. Why? It's funny because you're invalidating my opinion. Sorry, man. I didn't mean to. I just thought it was funny. What? What? <laughs> well, no, it's, it's what funny because. The way that people were ranting about it, and <laughs> not just you, but us as well. I, I just guess. don't. I just don't like Spike. That's that's my. The, that's it. Yeah. Cool. No, that's that's that totally is. understandable because he's been put in a lot of situations that have not been favorable for his character development. Yeah, that all. makes sense to me. So I, I could totally see how the episodes have not been geared towards making him the most favorite of yeah. characters, but mm-hmm. I just. Yeah. I don't see it. I think um, there's a couple of characters on MLP that do better as, like, secondary or tertiary characters. Um, like, yeah. m- maybe even Applejack could be considered. I mean, I, I love Applejack to death, but um, she does a, a, a lot better when there's an episode that's not focused on her, I think. Mm. Like, that's an excellent comparison because her her episode-centric episodes have been... Or sorry, her character-centric episodes have not been that favorable to her. Mm-hmm. Um, everybody's kind of had a favorable character-centric episode, mm-hmm. but I don't think Applejack has kind of had that. Um, but she plays a fantastic older sister to the CMC. Mm-hmm. She she plays a fantastic um, kind of voice of reason. Uh, and by the same token, I think Spike plays a fantastic um, uh, other half of Twilight. Yeah, yeah. definitely. I mean, he did an awesome job in the episode one and two of the season. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, episodes one and two were fantastic for him. Yeah, I loved every second that he was in those. You know, I I think it, and I said this when we reviewed um no not really reviewed but uh, spoiler casted the um Applejack episode. 
is that like sometimes when you have characters that are front and center, you focus more on their flaws or at least the writers focus more on their flaws and yeah, that sure. might not come off as favorable in the long run. Uh, mm-hmm. But if you have the character as like a secondary or tertiary character or whatever, they're usually helping to mend other characters' flaws. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. yeah, that could be what we're seeing here as well. So I have more than one reason for wanting to keep him in the background. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he's that's all I have he's to a say good about background it. character. That he is. Yeah. I highly enjoyed this episode. I thought the pets were amazingly done, but I just don't like Spike. And this episode <laughs> did not change my opinion. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, let's go rewatch the premiere. <laughs> uh, I got a hockey game to watch. Oh, yeah. Canadian. <laughs> uh, all right. Well, thank you for watching our spoiler cast. We don't know why you guys enjoy listening to us, but we'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> Brimming with confidence. <laughs> uh, no, uh, but seriously, thank you guys so much. Uh, and we will see you again next week. I'm FutterGuy317. I'm Burned01. I'm Rainbow Plasma. Bye. Later, guys. See ya. Is when I first like became a brony, I started looking at different artists and different things that I found interesting, and Cosmic Unicorn, our guest today, happened to be one of those artists that attracted my attention because at the time I had just started taking drawing one, and I had an interest in art, and like a blooming interest in art, and so all throughout drawing one, I was constantly just wanted to draw ponies and was looking at other artists for inspiration. So um, I would look at Cosmic Unicorn's pieces for different inspiration and things like that because all of the art that you happened to put on your DeviantArt was like something you were doing for an art project or some kind of recreation Mm -hmm. of like an old art master or something. Yeah. So it was always really cool because you took a more educational sense and an educational mind behind the art that you created rather than just making pretty pictures of ponies. Because I found that to be everywhere, but like the more educational sense or like fine art versions of ponies I found harder to find. Yeah, it was, it was kind of more of a matter of efficiency. Like I wanted, you know, I spent all day at school like drawing still lives and drawing a shadow sphere or drawing the figure, you know, just sort of really academic, boring things a lot of the time. And so I'd come home and then to practice the same principles, I would just do ponies or draw ponies. <laughs> <laughs> and then it turned out people started liking them, so I just kept drawing them, and it's, <laughs> it's gotten out of hand now. <laughs> <laughs> is it is it more freeing to draw ponies as opposed to, like, schoolwork? Um, like, can you have a bit more of a creative edge? Well, yeah, I mean, I always used it as, like, because I can practice all the same rules and art principles and everything, it, and... Even, they're simple. They're simple. They're basically shadow spheres with legs. I mean, they're incredibly simple sh- shapes. <laughs> and so it's it's fun to practice things like light with them, you know, or whatever. You did a light study of like a Celestia doll, didn't you? Oh, yeah, that was recently. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I would just use it as kind of like a fun way to practice all the rules, basically, well, after school. When you did the uh, Celestia... Uh, that was a painting, right? That was a traditional painting. Yeah, you were learning how to do oil painting, it's right? oil painting. Yes, I just started learning how to oil paint um, in the fall. Nice. Yeah, um, another random thing um, when we've crossed paths was uh, I was just learning to oil paint, and um, I had just completed my paint oh, stuff. Pinky Dash is having some audio issues. I think his internet's not doing so great. So if he doesn't pop in this episode, then um, that's, that's the reason that's why. Much. But, yeah. yeah. So last week we had an episode on clouds. But I did talk. So that's all good. <laughs> Media. Yeah, hey, get a part. We're, we're gonna have. Yeah, we're gonna have a couple. It, it, it's of, in my audacity. It's all good. We're gonna have a couple of interruptions here because apparently he can't hear us half the time. But that's okay. <laughs> um, oh, I heard you were going. I just wanted to it's interrupt. Gonna, it's gonna be um, a major editing job. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not. I just, want, I just, I just wanted to interrupt. It's okay. Up. So Flutter Guy was away last week, and you're back now, which is great. Right. Um, Yay. We had we had our clouds episode Mercury. last week because Yay. we couldn't get our special guest on. Uh, it turns out it was just a it was just a misunderstanding in terms of times and dates and things like that. I derped on the date. That's my bad. But yeah, and I derped on the announcements. But sorry. <laughs> regardless of the wide variety of derpage found on and off this show, um, we actually <laughs> have our special guest this week. So everyone should give a warm welcome to Cosmic Unicorn. Hi. Hooray. Hooray. 
Uh, yeah. <laughs> as you were, yeah, yeah, yeah. As you were saying before the show, this will finally give people your gender. Don't tell anyone. You had a funny story about Everfree Northwest, didn't you? Oh, yeah. Um, I had my boyfriend there helping me at my table because oh, how could I man a table by myself? It's ridiculous. And people kept coming up and asking him if he was Cosmic Unicorn or telling him that they liked his art. <laughs> <laughs> and he would just have to keep pointing to me. <laughs> no, I, I remember um, when I first stopped by, I went, I remember uh, Everfree Northwest, I had the pleasure of meeting you actually, uh, for those who don't know that. And I happened to stop by your table, but you were out at the time yep. and your boyfriend was just sitting there. <laughs> And I was like, I thought I saw somewhere that Cosmic Unicorn was a female. He's like, oh yeah, she's away. I was like, oh, well, this is awkward. I'll be back. <laughs> yeah, no, I was totally confused. You were, you were one of those people? Well, I had heard in a comment or somewhere something that, but I wasn't positive because I'm not that big of an online stalker. But, it's um, okay. I kind of make it ambiguous. <laughs> That's a, no, it's fine. That's all right. My gender gets confused all the time, and like I was saying, yeah. I have a podcast well, with thirty episodes. Well, Flutter Guy and Plasma are secretly female. So. Y- you're you're a girl, right? Girl Plasma. Yeah. Oh, yeah, of course. <laughs> as long as as long as we're on the same page here. Yeah. Okay. I'll I'll be whatever right, gender Joe. you are. Hey there, guys. This is Rainbow Plasma. I hope you enjoy our interview with Cosmic Unicorn coming up in just a moment. But before we start, I'd like to point out. Um, Pinky Dash's audio has been having some issues the last, um, well, it's been a, a, an issue for a long time, but uh, over the last four or five weeks or so, there's been a real big issue with it, and um, we've been looking into it, and I think I found the problem this week. Um, there's some electrical interference with his mic, meaning that when we noise removal to get rid of the background noise, it, it's taking, it's cutting out a lot of his um, audio quality. So uh, we're looking into that, and uh, we don't have a solution right now, but hopefully by next week, we will be able to have his audio up and uh, better. And if not next week, then guaranteed the week after that. Um, so there's that. Uh, so you, you won't be hearing from him a lot, and when you do from, hear from him, it'll be pretty bad audio. Uh, also, he was having some issues uh, with the internet connection. Um, I believe there's some sort of big storm going on uh, down where he was, so there was some issues with that so you won't uh, hear much of pinky dash this episode but hopefully um next week or the week after we can figure out a a new microphone get that situation sorted out and then we'll have him in much crisper clearer audio because uh it's strange when we're on like a skype call we hear him perfectly fine but when it comes out in his audio form it it sounds quite bad so hopefully we'll get it up to a level where you guys are hearing what we're actually hearing and um he'll be able to be a bigger part of the podcast because when he has such bad audio it's kind of hard to edit him into places anyways uh hopefully that'll happen in the next few weeks i hope you guys enjoy the interview it was a lot of fun to make and i hope you guys find some fun insightful things in it Hello and welcome to episode 31 of the QDR Crusaders for January 29th, 2013. Welcome back guys, I hope you enjoyed last week's episode and um, my name is Rainbow Plasma and today I'm joined by my co-hosts... Uh, Burnda1 and I'm the special guest coordinator. I'm FutterGuy317 and I'm the art coordinator. I'm Pinky Dash, I do all the questions and whatnot, miscellaneous junk. So painting one final, mm-hmm. uh, that was a... Uh, master study in quotes of a blitz ponies piece um, where i kind of did my own little interpretation of it and right when i finished it you did a little like critique post on the r slash my little pony vector school Mm -hmm. uh, on reddit Mm -hmm. and like right when i finished and it was like perfect timing and then i was like yeah and i like took the opportunity (laughs) opportunity to post my art piece on that and you actually did a really awesome critique, and it turns out you do a lot of awesome critiques. But um, <laughs> I guess that's another little thing we're cross paths where you did a critique on my oil painting when you were learning oil painting and I was learning oil painting, and it was really cool. And that was what actually made me finally grasp value, and that's how apparently all these memes have started. <laughs> but... Oh, God. I started it. <laughs> we'll, we'll get into value in a second. My yeah, goodness. That's why I brought up value. Um <laughs> at first on the show was because of that because seeing 
the use of value in my own piece from your critique just made it click, seeing it in my own work. Mm -hmm. That's usually how it works. So, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, so that, anyway, so no, I had a question about that. Mm -hmm. um, do you often do critiques for uh, people on DeviantArt or people in different communities, like art? It's like artistically speaking? Um, I do them whenever I have time, which is not often, but whenever I see a piece of artwork that I really like, and regardless of the skill level, it really doesn't matter to me, um, what I do to show the person that I like it is I'll give them a critique and how I think that they could make it better. And I'll show them by like editing it and everything. Because you can you can talk about how you should change it and you can, you know, type about it or whatever, but it's better to just show the person what yeah. I'm talking about. I definitely know what you and mean. Then I, and then I try to explain things so that anyone else who reads it, you know, can get an idea. And it also helps summarize the information in my own head. So it's kind of an ex a personal exercise in and of itself. Mm -hmm. So I can kind of, I don't know, just <laughs> yeah. review, um, review my brain. From what I've heard from a couple of teachers, one of the best ways to actually learn, even in your own art, is through critique. Mm -hmm. um, and we tell that to a lot of people, especially uh, in vectors and like the vector club, because to see something that's so meant to be so perfect. But no, I really appreciate that critique. By the way, it was awesome. It actually really helped me. Oh, awesome! Yay! Yeah. How long do you usually spend on critiques? Because <laughs> <laughs> joking about genders aside, um, uh. cosmic unicorn. For those who don't know and are fans, people watching, uh, and for those who maybe haven't heard of you or heard about your art, a generic question we like to ask on the show is if you could explain maybe who you are or what you do as an artist, or just tell us a little bit about yourself. It's kind of an open question, but uh, hopefully it. All right then. Um, well, <laughs> I'm an art student, and that's about it right now. Um, and being an art student is kind of a full-time job. Uh, lots of homework, <laughs> lots of work. Although I am working kind of part-time on an indie game project about squirrels, so that's fun. <laughs> but student is basically my life right now, so. <laughs> but there's always time for ponies, Craig. Um, I don't know. <laughs> These days, not so much. <laughs> I'm <Aww>. trying. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's tough, especially with school. Uh, I'm, I know, especially right now, I had a couple of things that I, I wanted to try out in terms of artistic stuff, and I've just found that it's it's... You know, the workload kind of picks up around this time of year, and uh, especially, like you said, with art students, it's always, you kind of have that big workload all the time, right? Yeah, pretty much. Mm -hmm. That's tough, that's tough. It's always fun when you can work ponies into something you do academically, though. I know you've done that a few times. Yeah, um, once or twice for a project, and then for homework. The, the Fluttershy, <laughs> the anatomy of a Fluttershy, and then um, the Seattle ponies were a project of mine. You did a... <laughs> master study on Gustav Dorr, didn't you? What, did you add the pony in before or after? Yeah, on the study was just of the tree, and then I drew Celestia uh -huh. separately on a piece of paper, and I just added it in. Separately. You know, I thought it was funny because you did that as a master study, and then I ended up uh, doing a master study of your master study with a Celestia mm -hmm. in it, because I fell in love with that piece. And so we, like, happened to feature that piece of yours, and then, like, my awful master study of yours redone in graphite. <laughs> <laughs> And that was a lot of fun. But. So, Burned, you, you know, I think we should talk just first and foremost about kind of the connection between you and, and Cosmic Unicorn because you've, a lot of the stuff that you've had on this show and a lot of the stuff that you've brought up on this show has roots with the guests that we have on today. So, do you want to yeah. draw the connections there? Um, well, connections. Uh, I guess it first started out 